everyone and thank you hi everyone and thank you for joining us tonight for this discussion sponsored by the new england chapter of the society of professional journalists i'm bruce gellerman and i'm here tonight thankfully with anthony scaramucci uh, perhaps you know him as the mooch mr scaramucci can i call you the mooch i've been called a lot worse than that <laughs> bruce so you can call me anything you want actually totally fine okay. how are so you Okay, well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. I understand last week you were in Italy. And you're back? I uh, I was actually in Greece, actually. But, uh, yeah, I'm back now. And thank you guys for having me. And uh, um, oh. what do you want to talk about? Happy to happy well, to take I, questions, uh, talk about well, whatever I, you guys want. Okay, so I'm going to throw some questions at you to be sure. And I just have a conversation, but I'm going to invite people to put their questions uh, in the chat room. And I'll okay. read that back. Uh, so you were a money guy. You were at the, you went to Tufts. You went to Harvard Law. You went to Goldman Sachs. Uh, mm -hmm. You started your own, uh, you know, investment company, Skybridge. Um, yeah. And you got this uh, global thought leadership forum you call Salt. And I'm just uh, shut this down while you're talking. Good, I'm listening. What is your T-shirt? Oh, look, well, I like your T-shirt. Tibbs on the moon. <laughs> it's on the moon. So, yeah. but you know, you went. And I guess you just recently have a book out. What is it called? From Wall Street to the White House and back. Yep. And uh, basically notes from a survivor and resilience. But why did you join the Donald Trump transition team? Why Why did you raise money for him? Did you believe in his policies? Did you believe in him? Okay, well, we're, we've got the benefit of uh, eight years since all of that happened, and we have a lot of uh, water under the dam now and a lot of uh, facts uh, related to Mr. Trump. But taking you back to, and there's a gentleman that just wrote a book about this, uh, America Through the Looking Glass, how Donald Trump and his rise through The Apprentice uh, led him to the presidency. But taking you back to the 2015-2016 time frame, I was with Jeb Bush who was a garden variety Republican Party uh, candidate, he lost to Mr. Trump. And so uh, the question before us as fundraisers, would we stay with the Republican Party? Uh, would we leave the Republican Party and not work for Mr. Trump? Or what would we all decide to do? Uh, some of us left, didn't stay with it. I made the decision to stay. We can analyze that. I, I've written about it extensively. I, I said that was obviously a mistake in judgment on my part. Uh, I didn't see the full on evil of him. There are many uh, New York liberals that say, oh, well, you know, we knew and we knew this, we knew that, we knew this other thing. Uh, but remember, you're, you've are you got two people that are running for president. You've only got two choices. Uh, you have a Democratic choice and you have a Republican choice. And so back in 2016, I was a uh, political fundraiser. It helped me get my career started. My first check that I wrote in politics was to Rudy Giuliani. In 1993, I was uh, young Republicans for Rudy. Um, you know, we can talk about Rudy today, but back then Rudy did a very good job for the city of New York. I spent uh, eight years working for him and then worked for George Pataki. Um, one of my classmates, uh, technically not my classmate, but he was in school with me at the time, Barack Obama ran for president. I gave him money. I raised him $150,000. Uh, I've given money to Chuck Schumer. I gave money to Hillary Clinton's senatorial run. Uh -huh. So I was a garden variety, New York style fundraiser. And so I made a decision, an incorrect decision with hindsight and perspective uh, to support the Republican nominee for president. Now, if you had asked me, let's say we had set up a meeting like this and it was a week before the November uh, 2016 election, let's say it was November 1st, that election was held on November the 8th. And you said to me, uh, uh, what's going to happen? I said, well, Trump's going to lose the election. He was down. Uh, this guy, uh, uh, Nate Silver, had him at a 97% chance of losing the election. Uh, Hillary Clinton was a uh, 97% chance to win the election. There wasn't a person on that campaign that thought Mr. Trump was going to win the election. I thought I was doing a service to the Republican Party. He was going to lose the election. And we would have a network in place to rebuild off of for the 2020 mm -hmm. uh, potential Republican Party election prospects. He won the election. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can believe this story or not. I've written about it. Um, my wife hates Trump probably as much as Melania hates him. I mean, I think Melania probably hates him the most of everybody 
that I've come in contact with, with a pretty high standard. But I said, my, my wife is probably close. She's up there. She didn't want me to work for him. I let my ego get the best of me. Um, and uh, I, I was yeah. hosting Wall Street Week. I have a great career in finance. Uh, started a company. We've got over, even today, we have over $4 billion in assets under management. Uh, didn't need the job, but I got my ego got the best of me. So uh, I was a blue collar kid. I blew up, grew up in a uh, the household of a crane operator and a homemaker. I had gone to Tufts and Harvard, Goldman Sachs, built a successful hedge fund business, had the chance to work for the American president. And uh, and I wanted to do that, even though it was the wrong thing to do. That was my ego and that was my pride. And mm -hmm. so I, I put my pride and my ego in 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 place. And I would tell people on this call, when you do that, when you put your pride and ego into your decision making, you make terrible decisions. Uh, I made one, got fired after 11 days. Uh, people don't remember this because everyone's got no attention span. Well, no, actually, I think you actually served for six days. You're actually on the job. No, no, no. I served for 11 days. Yeah, I, I didn't, you know, even no, Trump, even Trump, when he goes after me on Twitter, I sort of feel like he's the official scorer. He says I served for 11 days. I, let's you give know, it there's a, there was, I was a guy. Who, there was a guy who served in that position in the Reagan administration who was for, there for 11 days. Is Jack Kohler? Do you know that? Yeah, no, I remember Jack. Yep. Yeah, I know. He's yep. you guys are tied. Eleven days. Well, ago. actually, the, the 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 person that actually historically the shortest serving uh, White House communications director is Jason Miller. Uh, I have I've chosen to protect Jason because uh, he he was banging his assistant. Uh, he got his assistant pregnant while he was married with three kids, and so he was sworn into the job on January twentieth. He left the job on January 21st. And so I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, I'll take the bum rap of being the shortest serving comms director, but he's actually the shortest serving one. He, he served for one day, uh, but well, whatever, you know, look, it happened. Jack it was Kohler, a, you didn't do anything. Well, I don't know if you did anything dishonorable. Jack Kohler, who was Reagan's director of comms, he, he was a let go because it turns out that he was a, a member of the Nazi youth group. Yeah, no, I'm certainly not a member of that. And I, I definitely didn't do anything dishonorable. I got fired because uh, Tr Trump and I were fighting. Um, you know, people said I got fired because of the comments I made about Steve Bannon. Nobody, if you know the Trump administration, nobody gave a shit about that. Okay, in fact, uh, one of the things that I'm the most proud of in my tenure in that administration is I got Steve fired. Uh, he was fired on the exact same day as me. I explained to uh, Donald Trump what Steve was doing to him. Uh, he's such a baby, Steve Bannon, that he didn't want to leave the administration on the same day as me. So he begged General Kelly to stay for an extra 14 days. He was the chief of but, staff. No, no. He was a strategies person. Rice previous. Oh, no, Kelly. Kelly. Oh, Kelly was the chief of staff. Yeah. Kelly fired me and and he fired uh, Bannon. Uh, yeah. Kelly and I are very close personal friends. Obviously, he has no relationship with Bannon. Bannon is probably one of the most malevolent American uh figures uh he's a very 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 dangerous human being very bad human being uh he's, he's very smart he's in jail right now right? he's in jail right now he'll be out of jail he's trying to use the jail uh sentence as a, uh, a, a a martyrdom you know but you know listen people don't remember this either when i left the white house even though i got fired got fired after 11 days i stayed loyal to the president i'm i'm not a crybaby. I'm not someone that, hey, you got fired. I blame the firing on myself. I never blame Donald Trump or General Kelly or anybody. Um, it's a hard well, job to be president. If he wanted did, to have me serve you, for one day and fire me the next, no problem. Well, what was it that you said? You said you had an argument with him. Was it in the, in the Oval Office? Uh, no, it, it was it was actually in the study off the Oval Office. We, uh, we had uh, several disagreements, some of which are, you know, obviously even classified, I can't even talk about it, but, you know, the, the president is prepared to break the law. The president is prepared to disavow the constitution. And there was one scene, um, I can tell you it was on, a, it was on Friday, frankly, uh, July 28th. I, he told me that I was a member of the deep state, which I laughed about because uh, I grew up here on Long Island. I'm talking to you from my home here on Long Island. Uh, I think I went to Washington on a school field trip. I, I'm not a member of the deep state. Um, don't even believe that the deep state exists, but uh, 
you know, Mr. Trump didn't like that I had taken the oath that I had I had sworn to seriously. You know, you're 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 swearing an oath to the Constitution and to the institution of the American government and the institution of the presidency. You're not swearing an oath to the man. You know, Mr. Trump never understood that any capable American patriot uh, was there to serve the country and there to respect the institution of the American presidency, not necessarily specifically to be loyal to somebody that wanted to do things that were dishonest or potentially harmful to the country or in direct violation of the Constitution. You heard him in the run up to the campaign to 2016. You know who this guy was. Okay, well, that, that's the liberal argument, Bruce. And I and I appreciate you making that. And I've I've heard that uh, for the last 10 years. And there's a tremendous amount of smug liberals out there that have a certain argument about him. And they they, of guilty, course, guilty do. Is, guilty as charged. Yeah, yes. And of course, you know him better than I did. And you you know who he was. And of course, I didn't know who he was and all that stuff. So I plead guilty to all that. I'm not I'm, I'm, I'll see the argument to you that I made a mistake. It's a series of frog boiling moments where you're here, you're working for Jeb Bush, he leaves the race. Do you or do you not go work for Donald Trump? I make the decision to go do that. Uh, you raise him some level of money, you expect him to lose, he goes on to win. Now he's asking you to be on the transition team. He's now the American president. I move the goalpost again. Uh, and then he asked me to join the, the uh, presidency and to work in the White House. I love my country. I'm a product of this country. I'm a I'm a product of the American dream. It's been a great success story to live here in the United States for myself and my family. I took the additional leap to go work for him. Mm -hmm. But if you're gonna if you're gonna accuse me of not knowing who he was and sort of that smug comment that you're making, you're entitled to do that, and that's fine. But then you have to give me credit for standing up to him in August of 2019 when I was one of very few people that had worked in the administration, at least at that time. Mm -hmm that broke from the administration. Uh, he was scheduled and targeted for re-election at that time in August. It wasn't COVID-19 at that time. And I said that he's mad and he's got something wrong with him and a screw loose. And I disavow my support for him and I will work against him. Uh, so if you want to give me demerits for joining him, that's fine. But you've got guys like Kevin McCarthy, hate his guts, couldn't do that. you got guys like Mitch McConnell, hate his guts, couldn't do that. You've got cabinet Why do they? Why do they? Why do those They're guys? Cowards. They're cowards. They're cowards. They're, they they don't want the wrath of you. You think it's an easy job to speak out against uh, one of the most powerful people in the world. Uh, when I was speaking out against him, he was the mo most powerful person in the world or one of them. Uh, and he will use those powers malevolently against you and your family. So there are many people that will equivocate and fall in line. There are very few Dietrich Bonhoeffer's in Nazi Germany, you know, it's just the way it is. And so Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy will go down in history. Their legacy are the two biggest cowards in our civilization, uh, living cowards, because they had Trump. They could have put Trump through the ropes on the 7th of January. Uh, and they elected not to do that because of their cowardice. What they were you afraid of his coalition. What do you think of the MAGA supporters then? I, 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 I respect the MAGA supporters. Um, I lived among the MAGA supporters. I, I am a blue collar uh, kid. I'm the product of a blue collar family, an aspirational blue collar family. Uh, the people on this call should know uh, that those supporters, if you're going to be derisive towards them or treat them as deplorables, as uh, Hillary Clinton said, they're going to strengthen their uh, loyalty to Donald Trump. They're not going to disavow their loyalty because some smug liberal is telling them that they're stupid for supporting Donald Trump. You know, you should listen to some of the interviews of Bill Maher and you should you, you should recognize that these are your fellow Americans who have felt left out of the system. These are your fellow Americans that uh, once grew up in aspirational blue collar families like me, where these families are now economically desperational. Uh, and these families feel left out of the system. And so they they don't like big pharma. They don't like uh, the media establishment, the political establishment. They don't want to take the vaccine. Uh, they feel that the system has been very unfair to them. Uh, their living standards have declined while the wealthy living standards in the country have gone up immeasurably. 
uh, and they don't feel like that they have any advocate on their behalf. And so mm -hmm. Mr. Trump represents them. He's an avatar for their anger. There's also a white supremacy angle to it. Well, that's a portion of them. Probably seven or eight percent of them are white supremacists. They don't like the way the mosaic of the demography is changing. This beautiful, colorful mosaic of our country has gotten more beautiful and more colorful, and they don't like it. And so he represents them. He's the last white hope for them. He's like a living spam can. Uh, and he's out there, uh, you know, uh, touting for them. Now, the great irony is that Joe Biden has done more for them in the three and a half years of well, his presidency. Right. So but how is but, the but, but Joe Biden is looks like he's half dead. And so he, you know, you 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 got an 81 year old guy that can't put sentences together without a prompter. And so he can't sell his economic agenda or the things he's done for the country successfully. And so it's a real problem. They, they put themselves at risk for a return to Trump's presidency. And that will be a a very ugly period of time for America, because uh, while he's been away these last four years, he has the uh, anarcho Christo fascist right that is organized around him. So Trump himself is not really an ideologue. He's just a, a wounded, open pit, sociopathic narcissist, but he's not an ideologue, but he has these this group of people around him now that are incredibly well organized and are deeply ideological and they want to they want to turn the American country into the uh, first season, season one of The Handmaid's Tale. So, so is he he's their tool or he, he, they're his tool? It, they're, they're using each other. Trump, mm -hmm. Trump is not an intellectually curious person, but he does have a worldview. Steve Bannon can articulate it better than Donald Trump. But uh, Trump's world is uh, it's 1947. It's pre Jackie Robinson. It's a white world. It's a white power world. Um, excuse me. There are black and brown people in the country now. OK, that's fine. Are the black and brown people going to outnumber the white people? Yes, they are. Does that mean that the black and brown people are going to run the country? Mm -hmm. Yes, they likely will. OK, let's change the rules. And I don't want to have a democracy if black and brown people are going to run the country. And that that's Donald Trump. That's what he represents. And uh, he's trying to move himself away now from the project uh, 2025. But he is the progenitor of that project. He he is the person that has helped to author that project, and that's a very dystopian America. And I and I'll, I'll let you ask another question, but I want you I want to leave you with this one thought. He calls from the stump, and you guys apparently are journalists, professional journalism or something like that. He calls from the stump the deportation of 15 million people from the United States. So I'm not making it up, and he can't disavow that in Project 2025. He says it every night from the podium. So let's go over what that entails. That's a armored vehicle heading into your neighborhood with SWAT guns, pulling people that they have now deemed illegally in the country out of their homes. They're going to deport them. Okay, so how do you go about deporting somebody? I don't know if there's immigration lawyers on the phone here or deportation lawyers, but one of the first things you have to do is to find a country that's going to accept them. So you have to move those people into concentration camps. Um, you know, Mr. Did, Trump has been pushed on that. He said, no problem. Did you, know, did you know that the Supreme Court approved, called it constitutional in World War II to put Japanese Americans, people who've been I'm, on the tree generations. I'm well, in, I'm well aware of that. It's 80, that. They rule I'm well that. aware of that. That's one of the stains on Franklin Roosevelt's legacy. I'm well aware of that. I, you know, listen, you know, uh, uh, That's Teddy, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt said that Italian Americans uh, were non-Caucasian and Franklin Roosevelt, uh, there were several ships that had left Europe uh, with Jews that were departing a genocidal uh, maniacal regime and they weren't allowed entrance into the United States. This is not a perfect country. I'm well aware, I'm well aware of the stains that are involved in the country. I'm a well-read person. I, I, I know what happened to the Japanese in, in, the, in the 1940s. What role, how would you grade the media and i know that's everything from fox on down the media gets an f it's not a, it's not even a d it's a it's a letter grade f the media gets an f what, what could the media the media is trolling for attention the media has lost the plot in america the media has decided 
that we're going to chase eyeballs. So if it's salacious, we'll put it up there. If it's controversial, we'll put it up there. Uh, we'll we're we're going to chase eyeballs. So the new story of the week is, uh, you know, Joe Biden has dementia. Okay, but Trump is a convicted felon, a congenital liar, has a fascist manifesto that's 925 pages long uh, that is an archetype for a dystopia, literally an Orwellian America. But the media is focused on the fact that Joe Biden can't put sentences together anymore. But Look, that before, before, I mean, there's been some great investigative journalism dealing with Trump's money dealing with the, the the tapes, you know, uh, grab them by the, and uh, really some really hard hitting journalism. And the, the, the media, the, you know, there's one woman at the Miami Herald who is an investigative journalist that did a phenomenal job on the Jeffrey Epstein situation. Right. And she got that thing to the T and she stayed on it despite threats. She stayed on it despite all kinds of different things. I'm not saying that every single journalist out there is a letter grade F, but you asked me about the meta, the aura, and the energy of journalism. And to me, it's a letter grade F. The, the, the journalists have failed because they've lost their objective standard. They've lost their sense for what the job was originally. If you read David Halberstam's book, The Powers That Be, which is written almost 50 years ago, now maybe just over 50 years ago, uh, the way journalism was thought of and the way it was positioned in these companies is totally different than it is today. And the journalist, unfortunately, now is tasked with building their own brand, their own Instagram following, their own Twitter following. Uh, they're stepping out to places like Puck to get paid for their content. And so e even there, they've got to make the content somewhat salacious in order for people to buy it. Um, and, uh, you know, the... The country as a whole, there's there's a moving target to what the truth is in the country. You can't hit the truth because you don't know where to turn to well, in the truth community for the truth. Whose fault is that when they call it fake news? Right? They're the enemy of the people. That's so what this so That's Donald it. Donald Trump is at fault for that creation of the whole fake news, but the media has fed into that. Uh, you ever watch Fox News? Only when I'm in a very self, you know, flagellating mood. Okay, well, go, go you, but you got to watch it. You know, you're, you're, I you're, do. That's, you're, I do. you're into, I, obviously, you're an intellectually. I get the fact you're a liberal, and I get the fact that you have your liberal bias embedded. I haven't in said this conversation yet. How did you get that? No, you're obviously are. I mean, it's, 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 you know, the same way you're profiling me, I'm profiling you. But go watch Fox News. And, and spend the time to watch it, it is they set up a plot at the beginning of the day uh, and the programmer says, okay, this is going to be the outrage story of the day. It's either going to be whites being victimized by immigrants. It's going to be a war on Christmas. There's never been a war on Christmas. And they're going to pick a plot and they run that plot for 14 straight hours. And then the next day they say, okay, we have a new grievance to rile up white people. Maybe mm -hmm. someone crossed the border and raped somebody, God forbid, which is an absolutely terrible thing. So let's project that onto the whole universe of people that are crossing the border. Let's let's forget why they're crossing the border. Let's forget that Fox was a champion of reducing the aid to Guatemala and Ecuador and Honduras. And so it's like I submit to everybody on this call, particularly people in their middle age, you can take Crestor. Or you can get the triple bypass surgery when you're 78. You can take the Crestor for 30 cents a pill, or you can have the triple bypass surgery for $500,000. So the United States knows it has a problem at its border. You have very, very poor people in Central America. You could give them economic aid, and you can offer them economic development packages to keep them in their country. That's a one, two, three billion dollar problem. Or you could have a 25 billion dollar problem at the border mm -hmm. but you know the what the media doesn't do again you asked me to join your call so i'm going to give you my honest opinion the media is no longer calling balls and strikes they we have a prism where the story is being written from the left-leaning prism where the story is being written from the right-leaning prism and the media is no longer calling balls and strikes and there's no analysis in the media of what is right or wrong for the country 
It just there isn't. And if you if there is, you you I'm an intellectually curious person. I'll get a notepad. Um, you tell me the places to go where I can get the objective truth. You know, the CIA says that you have to read the Lamont. You read the New York, I'm sorry, the English version of the Lamont on your iPad, because the French don't give a shit about American politics. So you can read the Le Monde, it'll try to give you a very straight view of what's going on in the country. But there's no, the journalists have lost their standards and they've lost their way. And it's infected with biases. Now, people are probably offended by me saying that. I'm not trying to be offensive. So what are you, so what I'm are trying you to be observant. What, what, what do you read? What do you listen to? What do you watch for you? Well, I do read the Le Monde after the agency suggested that. That's a place that I go for, try to get non-biased political news. I do read uh, different news weeklies, whether it's The Economist or The Atlantic, Time Magazine. Of course, I'm in the uh, area of Wall Street, so I read The Wall Street Journal every morning. I what read do you think of The Wall Street Journal? Very biased. Very hard right, Rupert Murdoch biased. Okay, but The New York Times is out to lunch. The Washington Post is a dystopian, dysfunctional fiasco. You, you know, if you, if you read The Washington Post... It's now a broken jigsaw puzzle. There's no theme. There's no narrative. It's not the Washington Post of uh, Ben Bradley. That's not the Washington Post today. And, and 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 the problem is the Washington Post can't be the Ben Bradley Washington Post. It can't make any money being the Ben Bradley, well, which is why the, the family sold it to one of the richest people in the world, hoping that he would just be a money pit, you know, money drain, money loser. Uh, and he would be doing a national service of trying to run it properly, but he doesn't want to do that. He's bringing in tabloid journalists to try to create the sex appeal necessary to sell the newspaper to engender the ads. So is there is there a formula? You have a way of getting out of this mess? I mean, especially with social media, especially with AI. You, you got to have the baby boomer generation of which I am a member of die off. You have to have that happen because... The political class of baby boomers have absolutely failed the country. So you asked me about the journalists, the, the political class has failed the country. You you went from George Washington to George Walker Bush, $7 trillion of deficit spending. That includes all of the Reagan spending, everything, $7 trillion. You went from Barack Obama to Donald Trump to Joe Biden, $28.5 trillion of deficit spending. So you, you've burnt through the national treasure and you're accelerating your way onto a debt crisis because you have very, very bad political leaders. These are all narcissistic, so, nehilistic baby so boomers. Would you, so would you raise, they, so you, you're the conservative, would you raise taxes? Would you cut spending? Well, no, I, I, would, do, I would do what George W. Bush did. Okay, I would go back to the pay-as-you-go legislation, and just to remind everybody what that was, Dick Dorman and Bush came up with pay-as-you-go. You can Google it. Yes, uh, they, prom they promulgated it in 1990. Of course, what, it was a very simplistic. If we're going to raise social services, no problem. Have to raise taxes to meet that burden. You want to cut the taxes? No problem. Have to find something in the budget to cut to meet the tax. Because there was guardrails put on the Congress Dick Gephardt lost the majority because he teamed up with the Republicans, okay, and he got that legislation passed. And several of the Democrats that voted for that legislation got knocked out of the box in their congressional term. Mm -hmm. But it was the right thing to do for the country, okay? And so, so the first thing you would have to do is you have to tell the American people the truth, which nobody does. You say, okay, listen, this is a huge problem. Not going to be able to solve it in a year or two. This is a 25-year solution. We have to return to pay-as-you-go legislation. We have to benchmark our spending to roughly 20% of the GDP. It's right now at 27. And no matter what, come hell or high water, we're bringing it down one and a half points a year during this presidential cycle. If you want to get voted out of office, no big deal. But we got to bring it down from 27 to 23 and a half, 22, 20. And then on a going forward basis, okay, that's where the spending has to be, okay, because raising taxes is not going to solve the problem uh, alone. I'm not saying that taxes shouldn't be raised. In certain cases, they should be. 
Uh, but there's some simple things you can do to the tax code. You and I let both. Me, let me ask you something. You, you can eliminate all of these rich loopholes and you could force all of these people into you, alternative minimum taxes. You sound like somebody who's running for office. And I'm running for re-election in my marriage. I'm just trying to stay married. I, I, I'm just trying to stay married, Bruce. I'm not running for office. You asked me how you could solve the problem. First of all, if I came out of the box with as a candidate and offered that as a solution, I'm losing the election because Donald Trump's going to come in. He's going to tell people what they want to hear as opposed to what the truth is. He's, I'm going to I'm going to balance the budget in four years. That was his campaign pledge in 2016. Right. Right. So he uh, just for the record, he added eight trillion in deficit spending. So George Washington to George W. Bush, seven trillion. Trump on his own, eight trillion. OK, but, you know, Obama did it. So did Joe Biden. So so listen. I'm not running for anything, but you're asking me how to solve it. Okay, there's no conservative solution to solving this. There's no liberal solution to solving this. There, there would have to be a bipartisan solution where everybody gets some measure of pain, uh, but you put the country on a better path. And you also take the expectations and the over-reliance in the country off of a system that nobody can afford. Do you, you see know, bipartisans in anything? There's only one thing that's bipartisan right now, and that is the aggression and the nastiness towards China. Uh, that sells well to the populist right, and it sells well to the populist left. And there's there's only one place where we have bipartisanship in Washington. So other than that, I can't think of anything. Um, I can give you the left solution and the right solution, which always leads to no solution. Um, and again, you can dislike Trump, but he was right about a few things. And we have to accept that he was right about a few things. We left the Chinese unchecked. Uh, and we did that in a way that really hurt the poor and lower class of the country. I'm not saying anybody did it on purpose. It's an indictment of both parties. Uh, and that was a big, that's a big reason why we've had the rise of this level of populism. And it's, again, it's not only here in the United States, it's around the world. We, so, uh, you know, the press has has said, written, had videos, uh, stories, investigative stories about the excesses of Donald Trump, right? And those excesses long ago became normalized by the electorate. I mean, what do you do with that? What is the what does the media do with that? Well, you have a you have a bad candidate. You've had you 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 had Hillary Clinton, worst candidate in presidential history. Doesn't even go to Wisconsin. I mean, we 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 took nine trips to Wisconsin after the convention. Uh, Forty eight hours before the election, we were in New Hampshire. We flew from New Hampshire to Michigan. Twenty four hours before, we were in a farm field. In Pennsylvania, she was hanging out with Jay Z and Beyonce at some arena in Philadelphia. So she totally did not understand what was going on, or didn't understand the retail nature of the job. The American people want you to earn the presidency. They want you to work for the presidency. They think it's a prestigious job, and they want your ass in the seat, burning rubber, to work for the presidency. She didn't do that. You can hate him, but he did do that. Okay. And by the way. He shouldn't have won that. I mean, he only won by, you know, I don't know, 60,000 votes or whatever it was. And, and he, he won it through the Electoral College. But he still won it. That was the game. She he didn't want to play the game. Right. Okay. So now you have another yeah. shitty candidate. This guy's well, back. The you, you backed Biden until recently, right? No, I'm with Biden. No, no, no. I didn't I, say that. I'm an honest guy. Joe Biden should not be running for president. It is well, political yeah. malpractice on his part to be running for president at age 81. He knows he's got some issues. You, we, we know it's been verified now by the log at the White House that we've had a Parkinson's doctor come to the White House eight times in the last eight months. I don't think they're there to see Hunter, okay? So we know from looking at him, you, you may or may not, but perhaps you did have an elderly parent or an elderly- Did, did the press know this? Did the did news reporters know this? White House correspondents? Did they know it? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I think it was reasonably well known, and I think it was reasonably underreported, and I think, I think people knew it, 
and you know this is the thing that should piss everybody off on this call the right wing media was reporting about it and the white house was poo-pooing them listen i'm a i'm a joe biden fundraiser i've given money to joe biden i bundled for joe biden i was with him uh, two weeks ago in southampton at a uh, sorry east hampton at a fundraiser okay so they were telling us that he's great. He's on the Peloton every morning. He's sharp as a tack. He's a little older. He misses a few sentences here or there. The Joe Biden of the Thursday debate is not the Joe Biden of 2016 or the Joe Biden of 2020. You don't have to be a neurologist to see that. So now I'm with, I'm with him. Okay. I'm with this bottle of water versus Donald Trump. You want to tell me who's running against Donald Trump? Is it Kamala Harris? I'm with her. You want to tell me it's Gavin Newsom? I'm with him. I'm an American patriot. I love my country. I know what Donald Trump can do to the country. I got very, very close to the situation. I also think the good Lord gave me a break by getting my ass fired. But he also gave me a platform to speak out and to articulate the danger that Donald Trump represents. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that for my family. I'm going to do that for my kids. When you were in the fundraiser on Long Island, that was after yeah. the debate, right? Did you tell people that were going to donate, say, hey, why don't you just uh, use your leverage your money and convince this guy not to run? I didn't do that. No, it's not for me to do that. First of all, I'm I'm a lifelong Republican. I'm not plugged in, supercharged into the Democratic Party. Uh, I'm there as a patriot. Patriot first, partisan last. I'm there because Joe Biden... I may not agree with a lot of his policy decisions, uh, but he's an American patriot. He believes in the system. He believes in the decentralized nature of the government. He believes in the checks and balances in the government. He's trying. He's not trying to liquidate branches of the government and create an autocracy in America. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know your your family, okay, and my family are direct beneficiaries from a decentralized government. OK, because uh, the people on this call, unless they were born with money, chances are they probably weren't. They got here or one of their family members got here and they had the opportunity for some level of meritocratic advancement in this country because it's not a genuine aristocracy and it's not a minor monarchy or a dictatorial government. We know from sociology, when you get a dictatorial government, you get a power cling on effect. And you get an oligarchic kleptocracy and, and a very, very large group of people suffer in that. And so we have a smaller group of people suffering. It can be fixed with good public service and good policy. Uh, but these two men don't give a shit about that. Uh, they really care about themselves. They're baby boomers. You know, uh, you know, Biden's a little older than the baby boomers, but the baby boomers are, and again, I am a baby boomer, a yeah. bunch of selfish assholes, self-consumed. They want power and glory. And so thinking he's going to stay in the position, you know, he he could have left and he could have left Labor Day of last year. He said, listen, I'm 81 years old. Here are the 20 things I did for the America uh, infrastructure bill. We're reshoring manufacturing. We're now making microprocessor foundries in the country. Uh, I raised living standards. I raised wages. This is what I did to big pharma. They were screwing you over with the insulin. I'm giving it to you for thirty five dollars of treatment. Yeah. And these are the things that I did. But you know what? I'm 81 years old and I'm not the right guy to take this forward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the baton to a younger generation of Democrats. Let them fight it out in the primary. And let's have a younger Democrat, whoever that nominee is, I'm going to support. He would have been a hero, but he didn't want to do that because it's Shakespearean. Mm -hmm. you know, we're watching Macbeth unfold American style. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame. It's, it's Santa watch. Mm -hmm. And so play it out for me as you see it. He's not going to give up seemingly, right? That's what he said today. Um, um, well, yeah, I don't know. I'm going on Morning Joe tomorrow morning. And here's what I'm going to say, okay? I don't know what he's doing. Whatever he's doing, I'm doing. Okay, if he's running and he's going to malaprop uh, his way into the presidency again, fine by me. If I'm choosing between demented and dementia, I'm going with dementia. Okay, if there are two movies playing at your local cinema on election day, one of them is Weekend at Bernie's. The other one is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. 
I'm going to take the dead person over the crazy person that needs a lobotomy. Okay, that's me. So you tell me what he's doing, and I will give energy. I'll give media advocacy. I'll give time. Okay, I'll bundle for him. And I will sit down with as many blue-collar Americans that I can and explain to them the danger that Donald Trump represents long-term to their families. They don't understand what Project 2025 is. They don't understand Trump's platform. I have to take them through. Okay, so when he says he's going to deport the 15 million people, you're going to have concentration camps in the country. you got to be ready for this. When he says he's going to ban contraception, you could end up going to jail if you're using birth control. When he says that they're going to, you know, they're proud of getting Roe versus Wade illegal, one out of every four women in the country have had to deal with an abortion of themselves or a family member, and 14 states now have disallowed abortion. He's also got a group of people working with him that don't believe in IVF. So if you have family members on this call, which I happen to, that have gotten IVF babies, they would like to ban that because of their Christian well, views. Okay, but, the, but so we have to explain that to people. We have to explain what they, that hasn't is. This, hasn't been that been explained? Have no. people become so polarized? No, so, it hasn't been explained. No, no, you don't have a you don't have a messenger on the left to explain it. You don't you don't you don't have you don't have one person on the left. Wasn't well, that Kamala yeah. Harris was talking? I mean, she sucks, right? I mean, you know, she sucks, and I know she sucks. Okay, she sucks. Okay, and I'm not saying that because she's a black Who woman. Could be? Which... Rice was very competent. This is the problem with you guys on the left. You guys are into identity politics. So you picked her, okay, because she's a black woman, but she sucks. Why don't you replace her with Lloyd Austin? He's very competent. I don't care about these people's skin color. What did Dr. King say? It's about the content of your character. People know she suck. You don't. You don't have to be black, white, who, green who, to know that she you, sucks. She wait, sucks. Wait, wait. So she, I'm, let me I'm ask some. We're in a I'm racist. Talking, we're in a I'm racist, talking. sexist country. You think we Kamala are. Harris? We are. Yes, we are in a racist. What country are you living in? I'm here the last sixty years. We're in a racist. I'm sexist older than country. you, there, Mooch. I, okay, I, so and I, and, and you I don't think we're in a racist, sexist country? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. so we're in a racist, sexist country. Kamala Harris. First of all, if Kamala Harris was as articulate and, and was as energetic and was as vibrant as a Barack Obama, she could take Trump to the hoop and school him. How it's about Michelle about, Obama? It's not about her skin Michelle color. Obama. How about Michelle Obama? No, first of all, she doesn't want to do it. She's too smart. Number two, you gotta, you, you're you not going to go. This is why they should keep Biden, by the way. You're not going to go from zero uh, not battle tested, not thrown in the media soup with that glare and intensity, not going through the debate process and all of this stuff. You're going to go from zero, 120 days out, to president. It's just not, it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And and it didn't happen in in the, in the 60s when when Johnson came out of the race. RFK probably could have beaten Nixon. OK, but it was all it all got done too late. Then you had the fiasco at the convention, ironically, in Chicago. And when Humphrey came out of the convention, he was the vice president. He was a sitting vice president. He had the the power behind him of the Democratic Party. He lost the election. So, but, you know, the here's the good news. Trump, Trump, here's the good news. Trump's going to lose the election. OK, it's going to be a very close election. Oh, he's going to lose the election. Yeah. He's going to lose it because because Americans are generally very good people, they may have their biases or maybe some levels of polarity, but they just have to be reminded of how crazy it was under the Donald Trump regime and how his minions are going to take it up a notch from here. But don't so he will he will lose the election, but then the Democrats are going to have to figure out how to run the country. He will lose don't the election. You, he's not, not going to win this election. Your premise throws me a little bit. That is that you think that that, that people have not been informed of what Donald Trump, Trump is planning and, and capable of. I think they are. And yet. No. I, well, OK, you got it. You got it. Let listen to me. I think the media Bruce, has you seem like a, its job. You seem like a lovely, it? very smart guy. But you got to go to <laughs> Youngstown, Ohio. You got to go to Albuquerque, New Mexico. You got to go to the areas of the country 
yeah. that are blown to smithers. Where do you live, sir? If you don't, you don't have to give me the exact location. Uh, Which I, state I, do you live in? I live in the uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. All right. So you're living in an East Coast. You're an East Coast coastal elite. So am right. I. That's what we are. I grew up you in gotta, Brooklyn, by the way. I'm from okay. Brooklyn. So and I'm from Queens. You gotta. So you gotta I'm know. Kidding. But you're you're an East Coast elite by the standards of the Midwest. And so you got to go into those villages. You got to go into those towns. I lived have... in Paul Ryan's district in southern Wisconsin, in Janesville. Okay, okay, okay. and so, so I so, don't have to do so ask... case here, but okay. yes, okay, so, okay, but you t- okay. So those people are focused on the election. Those people are focused. They're not. My dad was never focused on the election. My dad was like, "What is the weather tomorrow?" My dad was like, "We're going to watch the news because I got to work outside tomorrow. I got to figure out what the weather is." So when your mother lays out my clothes and she puts my lunch pail in the refrigerator, I think they're highly politically aware. I was living okay. in Wisconsin I don't for many agree. years, and 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 I do think so. Okay. And- All right, so we we disagree. Yeah. I think that they're low information voters. They vote on name recognition. They vote on a superficial thing that's going on. Uh, and by the way, um, Rupert Murdoch understands that better than anybody because he's chanting all day dementia, dementia, dementia. Uh, Louis dementia, this kind of dementia, 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 what? because he wants the low information voter to go into the booth. Trump, successful entrepreneur, which he's not. And Biden's got dementia as he wants them to pull the lever for the, the right winger that's going to give him the and tax cut. I get I get that. I get that. So my question to you is what, if anything, can truly dedicated reporters do that they haven't already done? Because I do fault the media in many ways of normalizing him. So dedicated reporters can read that 925-page document and they can write the screenplay for what America is going to look like with that document. They can say, okay, let's take immigration. And let's they take turn around, He turns around and says, I had nothing to do about it. Even though the press has said, here's the video of him talking about it. Here's him with the guy. Here's him. You know, I mean, so, so then, so then interview a body of psychologists and sociologists and have them explain to you how he's one of the few people in the civilization that can say two things simultaneously contradictory to each other. And he doesn't get called out on it. So you have to say, so what is it that he's doing? What is that he allows doing? him to get away with that consistently, not today, but over 50 or 60 years. Right. You know, when he used to do that to me, I believed him. You know, when he when he 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 gives you catnip for the base and he gives you catnip for the detractor, and so that the base can say, Well, he said this, and the detractor says, Well, he said that. Well, you know what? He said both those things. So how is he getting away with that? There are very fine people on both sides. You got the lunatic Dilbert cartoonist telling you, no, no, that's a hoax that he likes Nazis. And let me explain to you why. But in the meantime, he said he liked the Nazis. Okay, so so how is he getting away with that? So what journalist, how, what journalist is going to write that story and say, okay, so he is saying it. We, we have him on tape. Uh, we see him saying it. He's mm-hmm. saying this now. And so how is he getting away with that? My question exactly, and my question to you. I mean, he was convicted so, of- So, so I, know, I know the answer to that, but I think you got to get- of, of rape. Got, You got to get more people focused. I know he's getting away. He's getting away with it because a very large group of people in the country have a grievance. They have a grievance against the status quo. They don't like what's going on. You have a 14% approval rating for the Congress, slightly above Kim Il-jung, the North Korean dictator. And yet each congressional seat has a 96% return to the incumbent. So this is a group of people where the product sucks. People are coming into the fast food restaurant saying they hate the French fries. And they're still delivering the same shit French fries. And And so they don't have to change the product. You you have an oligarchic duopoly going on at the top. They're controlling it through gerrymandering. They're controlling it by isolating and blocking third parties from entering the process. They're controlling it through the way they raise money through campaign finance and the political action committees. 
Citizens United is the Plessy versus Ferguson of the democracy. Well, it created, let, me return, it created, let me talk then to you about the Supreme Court. Is the Constitution broken? Is the court broken? The Constitution is not broken, but what the Constitution is in need of is amendments. So the Constitution was supposed to be a living document. You got 27 amendments since 1789. You should be picking up one amendment every eight or nine years. The last amendment was in 93, the 27th, which is procedural. The big amendment, which was the 26th, was the Civil Rights Act of 1965, is 59 years old. It's too long. We haven't had an amendment. You know, your phone went from iPhone 1 to iPhone 15. You have to amend the Constitution. So the, the you document... Think, you think this Congress is capable of coming no, together? No, you didn't, no, no, no. I didn't say that the Congress is capable. That's, how you, that's how you amend the Constitution. No, I understand that. But they... because So you have to then break the system. You got to get an entrepreneur into the system. And you got to get a transformational person into the system to explain to the American people what is actually happening. Okay, that person will get lit up and destroyed by both sides. And then hopefully that person has enough money or wherever they can stay in the game. And you got to pull the non vote. Let me, let me submit this to you. And I want you to think about this. The most powerful voting block in the country is 144 million people. They vote the exact same way in every single election. The most powerful voting block in the country, it's the non-voter. They don't vote. So if you're an entrepreneur, there's a whole market of people that you could go to to pull them into the swimming pool. But they don't vote. They're apathetic. You know, you're telling me everyone's high information voters, but country's in a crisis. You know the country's in a crisis. I know the country's in a crisis. The people on this call know it's in a crisis. There's 144 million people have checked out. So and what's when, the and when you interview them, they say, well, this sucks and my vote doesn't matter. And so I'm not going to vote. So but let's you get an see. entrepreneur to pull them into the business. You could get the cause. Entrepreneurs believe in zero to one. They take something out of nothing and they turn it into something. You could get an amendment passed in this country, take 10 years, but you'd need an entrepreneur to dig in and to focus on a new market of people, scare the living daylights out of the current oligarchic duopoly. Okay. If, if, you, Joe, if, if, Joe Biden were, if Joe Biden was to win this election and he yeah. called you up and he said, you know, Mooch, I need you as the co director of comms in the White House, yeah. Yeah. would you take it? No, I would say, sir, I did that. I absolutely sucked at it. You don't want me as the comms person because when I, I, I gave a press conference the first day that I was there. So Trump asked me to go to the podium in the Brady press room and I gave a press conference. Uh, I spoke for 45 minutes to the press, 35 million people saw it. When I was walking up from lower press back to the Oval Office, my phone was ringing. It was a Republican opposition research operative, friend of mine. He got on the phone and said, what the hell are you doing? I said, what are you talking about? Because that was a terrible press conference. I said, it was. I thought it went pretty well. He said, you can't talk like that from the press booth. You can't talk direct like that. And you're scaring the living shit out of these senators up here. I got senators from your party calling me saying, get this guy the fuck out of here. And what do we have on the guy? You're laughing because you know that it's true. Okay. So I, I, know I, it's true. I, I hung up the phone. I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a problem here. Joe Biden wouldn't want me as his comms director because I'm the wrong guy. I, I'm gonna tell you the truth. These guys don't want. Hey, so hey, who who's the most important literary figure in Western fictional literature? It's Cassandra. Homer Homer blessed us with the literary figure Cassandra. Who was she? She was Priam's daughter. She predicts the future. She predicts the future, but she's cursed. She's given the gift of clairvoyance by the goddesses, but she's cursed that no one will believe her. Mm -hmm. You got a guy named Dean Phillips. You ever hear of the guy? Oh. He, okay, he ran against Joe Biden. He was the congressman that said, this guy can't make it to the election. I'm going to run against him. I'm going to primary him. Mm -hmm. He had one or two people, I think they were family members, turning out at his events. But he told the truth. We don't like the truth. We can't handle the truth. Aaron Sorkman took the Cassandra figure and turned it into the Jack Nicholson military protagonist in the movie A Few Good Men. Right. You can't, you can't handle, handle the truth. 
Why? Well, what did Marcus Aurelius say? You can't handle the truth because you're going to die. And so you got to get up in the morning. You got to live with some level of denialism about your own life so you can get through the day. What but if we could, if if we could handle up. the truth, if we could handle the truth, we could fix the problem. The, 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 this is an unbelievable country. This has got unbelievable intellectual resources, natural resources. It's got an, forget about the Supreme Court for a second, because they're transient and that is fixable. But the long-term precedential nature of the judicial system is very sound, which creates a lot of capital formation into the country. This is an unbelievable country, okay? Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of Singapore, uh, when asked a year prior to his death, what are the prospects for America? He said they're unlimited because they can draw from the rest of the world. You can come from Italy, be an Italian American. You can come from Eastern Russia, be a Russian American or a Jewish American. You can come from Japan and be a, a Japanese American, but you can't go from America to Japan and become an American Japanese. You can't do that. So we can draw on the entire world. Now, we've screwed that up with the way we fight over the immigration, but we could fix that too. Mm -hmm. There's an unbelievable footprint here. It would take about 20 years to dig out of these problems, but they're all resolvable. Mm -hmm. So you don't see a country at revolution, a country at civil war. You do or you don't? I don't, no. That's a mm -hmm. bunch of bullshit. Nobody's got time for that shit. They're trying to raise their kids. What they would like is a transformational leader that wants to unify the country. Neither of these candidates have the skill set or the capability to do that. What they want is a guy or a woman that says, OK, we're going to compromise. You're going to get 80 percent of you want on this turn. Those guys are getting 20 and we're going to flip it the next time. And everybody calm down. And the other thing that you need, which really pisses me off about the left and the right, don't fo force your culture on me. I don't give a shit that you're gay. Don't force it on me. The flip side, don't force your contraception stuff and your views on abortion on me. But unfortunately, and my own views, the First Amendment tells me I have been, my, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, we've got laws and lawmakers and a Supreme Court and judges in the federal level and the state level who are who are deciding these issues. It's the culture. bro. Come on. You know, it's the culture The the culture warriors want to take their view of the world Cultures and the way they live. And they want to force it on you. I don't want it forced on me. I don't want the right forcing their culture on I can, me. I can hear somebody. And I don't saying, want the left. I can hear somebody forcing. saying, you know, I, I, I like slavery. Don't force this freedom stuff on no, me. No, 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 no. That's yeah. not what I'm saying. I want the left to live exactly the way they want to live. I'm not saying that. I'm well, a libertarian. I want the you live any way that you want to live. Of course, you should live free. And your sexual orientation is your business. And the way you practice your religion is your business. <laughs> But that's but not to force it on me. Oh, OK. I, I, the right is more dangerous than the left with this. They want to force their way of living on you. I but, don't want their way of living. OK, let me ask you this last question. I'm a reporter, right? Or we have reporters on this call. What role do they play right now? You, you said you should read the 950 pages of the 2025 document. 925 pages. 925, sorry. Um, what 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 do we do? What, what how do we serve the nation? How do we how do we do our jobs to your satisfaction? Because the the the, the industry that I left two years ago when I retired so, is transformed. So 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 I want to I want to tell you what I honestly think. Okay. And you'll be probably people are already pissed off at me because I have my views and people probably disagree with me. But I'm going to tell you what I honestly think. Everybody's got to eat. Everybody's got to eat. And so you got to eat. So you've got to do your job in a way that feeds your family. OK, but that's not your only job. OK, so as an example, I run a very nice multiple billion dollar hedge fund. My kids are upstairs. I came down here to talk to you. I could drop the politics. I could stop talking about Donald Trump. I don't have to give any money to Joe Biden. And I could go about my world and I could feed my kids and my family. But it's not the right thing to do. Okay, the right thing to do is to engage in the civil discourse 
and to engage in the debate and to flush out more truths. So if you said to me, what do I want you to do? I want not hard left and I don't want hard right. I want right or wrong. It's the same thing I want from my public servants. The left is right about a lot of different things. A lot of the things that you were suggesting, the progressivism, the liberality of life and people being accepted despite their race, color, or creed, or whatever it might be. The left is right about that. That's progress. The word progressive actually came from Teddy Roosevelt, but it is progress, and the left is right about that. But the right is also about right about certain things, too, Okay, in terms of the formation of businesses and the flow of capital and the need to have fair regulation. They want to under-regulate, which I don't agree with. Deregulate. It take apart the administrative state. I don't I don't want to do that. I understand that we need to have a referee. You see, so there's right and there's wrong. The right so, is right about a few things, left is right about a few things. And so all I'm saying to you as a journalist, you got you got to eat. I understand that. So you got to write a story, it's got to catch eyeballs so that you can pay for the bread on your table. But in addition to that. In my opinion, there is right or wrong. There is things that you or I can do to explain to people what is actually happening to make it better. You know? I think okay. I'm getting cut off here. It's 904. Thank 904 you. 904. And Anthony, thank you so very right, so much. I probably, I probably pissed time everybody time. off. I'm sorry if I did. No, you didn't piss me but, off. You know, I, I, I've enjoyed it. And I, and, no, you know, you know I, I, it's, uh, it's very compelling. I don't agree with you on many things, but that's that's okay. That's that's, that's the beauty of the thing. I don't want you to agree with me on everything. No, no, no. I'm good with that. By the way, if I agree with everything, how interesting is that? It's not just interesting. And we agree with each other. Then. If this was an interview that I needed to excerpt and make and had to con con condense into a news article, how would I pull the quote? Which quotes would I use? How would I set it up? What would I, would I say? Say that, that hey, hey, we have we have a society that's got to get pulled back from the brink on a number of different things. We're at each other's throats for absolutely no reason. We can all live here peacefully. We can all live in our own little cultural hubs without upsetting each other. We got to pull ourselves out of this debt crisis. Okay, guys, maybe you're not as focused on me. I'm a trained economist. That is going to spiral. You're going to have a $2.5 trillion interest payment. You're going to be taking in, you're going to be taking in four and a half trillion dollars of money. Mm -hmm. Two and a half trillion has got to go to the interest to service the debt. You won't have money for anything. You got to get it under control. You've got to bring it down. Okay, you know we're never going to pay it back, and I know that. That's fine. But you can grow the economy around it by slowing down the spending. You got. We have to do that. If we don't do that, you're going to hurt your grandchildren. I don't think anybody on this call wants to do that. People are very thankful. They, okay. They're putting in the chat that they're very thankful for for your comments. No, I'm your just telling you. You know, I, I'm I'm just, just I'm I'm just telling you. My problem is, which I could never be a politician. I'm going to tell you what I think. Oof, no politician does that. I can't do that. Then you piss off half the people. All right, thank you guys. I appreciate it, Bruce. Bruce I appreciate it. little. I Little on the liberal side with the first comment about, well, didn't you know Trump was an asshole? Yes, I knew he was an asshole. I thought he was our asshole. I didn't realize he was that's a, not a liberal a comment. Sociopathic Hitler. That's not, a liberal, that's, not a liber, that's not a liberal comment, but that's okay. I, right. I'm, I'm Whatever. We'll talk about it. As, right. opportunity. You I'm and I will talk good. about it over a beer. All right. I'm, I'm coming down to Long Island the, in the coming months. Got to go. Right. We'll, come, we'll, go, we'll go have a beer. I know we're in overtime. Thank you guys for having me. All right. Thank you very much. This lighting much. makes me look like Charlie Chapman with like the kabuki makeup on. I have to figure out what I'm doing. All right. See. Thank you, Adam Senate, president of the uh, uh, the New England chapter of the uh, Society for Professional Journalism. He's did an incredible job setting this up, and I'm very thankful. And thank you all for joining us. Take care.